chapter 25. This is an intriguing chapter. Mm -hmm. Russia, summer 2004. And as I um, was rereading this chapter, I, I really sensed there was a, a change in how you are continuing with the book in the, in the writing style. And I feel like this is going even deeper into your spiritual experiences. Well, certainly it is. See, I'm now uh, well into my 50s, whereas the first pages of this book were, um, I was still in my 20s and 30s. So it's, it's uh, quite a number of years have passed. So very, of course, the uh, my uh, appreciation of things spiritual has developed considerably and it will go on, on doing so. How important do you think it is for those of us that have a meditation practice to practice our meditation early in the morning? <laughs> My own views on the matter, let's say, are, are that broad, but it's a tradition that goes back, I suppose, to the beginning of history that, that anybody who who seeks to approach God usually finds that first thing in the morning there's a clarity about the, the atmosphere um, before the, especially if you're living in a public place where the action of the world um, you know, cars start, people start getting up, going to work and all that sort of thing. Um, switching on the radio. Whereas in the early morning, and, um, there's usually a, a pause from all that. And if you go to bed earlier, so you wake up earlier, so you're refreshed. And then it certainly is by, by very, very long established tradition, uh, those conducive times of by whatever means you choose to approach God or to, to approach almost anything, anything that requires clarity of mind. I know you see some people are naturally um, what we call skylarks and others are <laughs> find it difficult to get going in the morning. Well, not, I can't really comment on that. That just seems to be the way some people are. I've always been one of the lucky ones that function well in the early morning. The other thing that um, kind of came up for me as I was rereading this um, chapter is your first sentence in, in chapter 25, you write, as more windows have appeared, this book has grown, and I've wondered if it was becoming too long. And my, my it's that maybe a personal question, but one of the things that I notice is reading spiritual texts is because um is an important part or it has been an important part of my journey but then there is a point more and more where i feel that um it's just more words so mm -hmm. i love how you write in here that um taking your time with the book or with the studying of any spiritual text and absorbing in it or sitting with it versus just reading it from cover to cover. What, what is your experience around that? Like the intellectual approach, I sense from, your, from what you have shared with me, there is a time when that has become less important. Well, to answer your last bit first, yes, certainly um, as, a, as a young man, I suppose, twenties, early thirties, I read fairly widely, and uh, I've read progressively less ever since. I think, and now I hardly read anything at all. Certainly, the habit has grown in most of us of, of just gobbling down texts like spaghetti. You might say, you know, <laughs> you, you, uh, you know, so I, I notice often uh, some in rage when people take get hold of my book some of them console to just gobble it down and obviously they don't get anything out of it at all <laughs> um, 
And so here I uh, I spend a couple of pages really on trying to persuade people not to read too much too soon and to rather dip in. Um, and that's certainly how I recommend it. Just read one paragraph at a time, which is quite enough because because uh, when you think that that each of these paragraphs has 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 lifted me up for a matter of days or weeks. And, and yet when it's put in a book, people with far less experience than me just read it in a few seconds and pass on to the next before they've even begun to digest what's in it, which is one of the unfortunate effects of putting all these things together in a book. You see, it would indeed be much better for people just to read, as I say, one paragraph at a time, one paragraph a day is quite enough. Then you'll get a lot more out of the book. <laughs> I love that. That's great advice. How do you, what do you feel about reading a paragraph or even just a sentence prior to meditation and then meditating on what you read? Well, that is one way of, uh, of meditating. Um, it's very, I don't really like to comment on on in people's practice. It, it's such an individual thing, and talking like this on the internet where thousands of people are listening, what I say to one may not be appropriate to another. It is some people meditate in that way. It's not something I was I've ever done myself. I was not taught that way, and I've never done it. Uh, I think uh, there are better ways. A simple mantra I would generally, for those who, seri want, who seriously want to meditate, as opposed to just thinking about something. If you just want to think about something, read something, and then think about it. But don't. But 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 that's not what I call meditation. Not real meditation. Um, a lot of for a lot of people, meditation just means think. Another sort of thinking. Whereas for me, uh, real meditation takes you beyond the mind, beyond the thinking process. It's not a very good idea to start it off with a, with a thought, is it? I know on your social media channels, people often ask about meditation and anyone watching, there are some wonderful videos that John did that are on John's YouTube channel on using the Jesus prayer. So I think that's very helpful to people to watch those videos with your, with you sharing about the Jesus prayer and how you have used it. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes, well, yes I rather agree. Yeah. John, can I um, ask you to read this paragraph on page 204? It's the top paragraph because I think this is, such a beautiful um, description of your, as you call them, windows, and also mm. things have are shifting in how you are, are continuing writing this book. This section of the book will not enhance or interest a worldly point of view. Readers will find that familiar references the who, where, when, with which we define things, giving both them and us identity, are missing. As we grow into a spiritual consciousness, this is exactly what happens. The fallen images of separate life are left behind revealed to be a fraud. Mortality dies out. Reality does not. This book will not uplift or enthuse me, nor will it satis wholly satisfy a thoughtful mind. It does, however, amply indicate that me surrendered opens up into that 
treasure in heaven, which ego can neither penetrate nor see. It may at first seem improbable, but as the process gradually unfolds, so gentle and self-evident, you wonder why it is not more widely understood. Troubles are all at the beginning, when the murky mind of ego is still trying to include itself in light. Understand this and the principle of letting go comes clear. Then the way opens to discover that the love, peace, joy and all hearts yearning that elude us in this world are waiting inexhaustibly in spirit. I know you have um, demonstrated the letting go. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit more about letting go, like maybe a practical example in day-to-day -day life, maybe from your own experiences. Well, I suggest a cold-blooded letting go is more or less impossible. I mean, I can't just walk down the street and let it go. <laughs> I can't just <laughs> look at myself in the mirror and let it go. <laughs> it might, might sort of crumple onto the floor if I did. I don't know what's for. <laughs> but letting go happens when we find an alternative, you see. And this is why the practice of working with attention is so important. Because for example, I'm now sitting in front of a computer screen talking to this lady over in America and I'm giving her my attention. Well, in order to do this, I've got to forget about what's happening in my kitchen. You know, I may have left my, my supper in, in the sink unwashed, but... Um, well, I've forgotten about it. I've just left it there and I've come and sat down in front of this computer screen to give my attention to this to this interview. And so I'm not thinking about the political situation. I'm not thinking about what the weather's going to do tomorrow. I'm not thinking about, about how, how we're all going to survive another year. All that's been laid aside. I've let it go to give my attention to this situation in the present. That's how it works. It works by attending to what's in front of your nose, what you got to do. And then you'll find you've automatically stopped attending to all the other things. It's really just called whole. I think really it's summed up by the modern phrase mindfulness. It's just being 100% attentive to where you are. Much of of not being present is because we we spend so much time thinking about either the past or the future. Now, if you can if you can learn to function more in the present, when you walk, just walk. When you wash up, just wash up. When you eat your supper, just eat your supper. When you're talking to someone, just talk to someone with full attention. Then then uh, you've no more attention to go here, there, and everywhere, and get involved with, with other things. If you want to attend to the state of the world, okay, well, you get on and do that. And, um, and but to do that with full attention, you've got to let go of everything else, haven't you? You probably won't sit down and listen to a John Butler interview, will you, if you're sorting out the world? You've got to more important things to do. <laughs> so that's how, it's, that's how it's achieved. Very simple. It's all to do with giving attention. And then all the other things are automatically are let go of. What about 
the role of emotions in letting go. Because I, from my own personal experience, it's like my emotions sometimes get me in trouble just as much as my mind does. Well, why do we say emotions get you in trouble? Maybe it's, it's wonderful, but maybe they're very good for you. Maybe it's just what you need to let the emotions run. Have some deep, bring some deep feeling into life. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not one to try to control my emotions at all. I'm all for them. I don't know why, where we get this. Again, it's, uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't know why we started apologizing for our emotions as though there's some, something we shouldn't have. Quite extraordinary. I think it's a feature really of, of, of Western intellectual, Western intellectualism. In countries like Russia, nobody dreams of controlling their emotions. They love their emotions. It's what makes a person interesting. Great hearted people. Where tears easily rise and flow. Indicative of great hearts, deep feeling, great hearts. What's wrong with emotions? Why should you want to control them? It's love, isn't it? Who wants to control love? I don't. Sorry, have I rather sat on that one? I think it's, I'm, I'm sitting on it, John. I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about the beautiful emotions such as love or like I was just in Yellowstone Park and seeing baby bears and baby buffalo and nature. Mm -hmm. It's just for me very heart opening. Then I mm -hmm. come back into civilization and I see people cutting down trees and and then my emotions aren't so pretty. <laughs> and if I don't control them, I might end up in jail. Well, or or, or you might um you might uh, harness them to uh, you might use them to to develop a, a way of life that favors what you love or you might harness these these other emotions in the in the service of what you do love Yes, that expresses it better, you see. And I'm sure this is what had happened to me. It was, it was my own despair at, at, uh, at the way man treated nature as a young man that, that led me to dedicate myself to, to uh, the, uh, the beginnings of what's now called the organic movement. In fact, it's always been, been the... the the power of my love and the despair of, of it not being recognized, this has motivated my whole life. My dear, I'd, I, I feel quite shocked that, that, that you should want to control these, this message from your heart that's, that's naturally discriminating in you between what for you is true and not true. Yes, that, sorry, it's taken me rather a long time to get the words out, but that, that's what I mean to say. It's natural discrimination, knowing what's better. If you'll, How will you ever know what's better un, until we're confronted with what's worse? How do we know what's worth living for unless we come face to face with what isn't worth living for? How will you ever follow the light unless you're, you know what it is to be dark? There you are, it brings it down to simple terms. Mm, that's very helpful, John. I find this very helpful of Instead of trying to suppress it, you, you redirect it. 
it's it's what I'm hearing. You see, if it's when we try to suppress something, that's just ego, 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 isn't it? And of course, the ego is a slippery customer. The ego will pretend that it's controlling something it doesn't like, but that's just another facet of ego. It's just ego playing with ego, really. Um, but much deeper than ego, there is a natural, I often talk of a compass within one's heart that, 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 that points to truth. And it knows, it knows, has a very deep instinct for what is not true, what is not the way to go. That's why this is a good saying, follow your heart. And where your heart isn't at home, where your heart isn't at happy, don't go there. and show the poor unfortunates that are caught up in that world, show them a better way by your example. For example, if there's a conversation talking negatively about that something, you don't have to join in. Do you, I hope this is helpful for some, other people, not just me, but it's very helpful. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you want to continue reading because um, the rest of this section is... Um... This unlimited potential may at first feel as featureless as being at sea. The subtle depths which seamen know and love take some experience to be discerned. Nevertheless, nearly everyone loves a day at the seaside, even if the sea, glimpsed between diversions, remains little more than a background. It is enough. And so it is with spirit. We take or leave it as we want and can. A restless mind intent upon its own designs will probably ignore it. A quiet one is already halfway there. The heavenly kingdom may be likened to a great house full of wonders. Formidable may be at first sight, but whose many windows don't forbid a look. As fools rush in where angels fear to tread, caution takes us slowly. As they have done for me, the windows accompany a journey whose meaning will unfold with every view. Read simply and acknowledged with no requirement to accept them or reject, but held in view as one might remember visits to some famous place. They may remind us that this glorious and ever present house is in fact our spiritual home. However, just in case, lest readers overreach themselves, it would be best to read in easy stages. Curiosity usually wants everything at once, and to start with, I dare say some will go through to the end. But even if they wanted to, who could take what's given in that way? Even prepared by years of meditation and being the blessed receiver of these windows, I still look back and find myself amazed. Only one such might have been sufficient, let alone a hundred. It's not that the message is complicated, it's utterly, utterly simple but our own worldly conditioning simply won't accept it. I do beg readers who find the book too much to lay it aside and wait a while, then try again, dip in a little at a time. Please don't try to swallow more than you can chew. 
it only results in needless indigestion. Spiritual indigestion is just as real as what happens in your tummy. And I know countless people who, who try to swallow too much spiritual reading or spiritual teaching or spiritual one thing and another and end up with indigestion. You also write in this chapter about your experience in Russia yes. in, in a church and you mention Holy Communion is for the healing of soul, mind, and body. Spirit is already whole. It doesn't need anything else. Do you want to talk a little bit about <laughs> Holy Communion and <laughs> spirit and soul? Those are such big terms and words in spirituality, but do we really know? That's a very difficult one indeed. Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm rather, I'm rather, um, I'm rather uh, balking at these questions, aren't I? Um, Are you giving me a hard time, John? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I rather feel I should perhaps pass on this one because Holy Communion is such a a deeply held conviction by uh, by very many um, seriously minded people. Maybe you can talk. I'm, I'm not really sure that I have the right to trespass on this particularly sensitive field, especially not on such a public platform as internet. Um, all, all, I'll, all I'll say, my dears, is that I, I think those of you who listen to me know that I like to keep looking out of the window at the sky. Now, I talk about spirit. Now, spirit cannot be described, but, but as the sky is in contrast to the world below, this all-embracing, all-containing sky, so is spirit. Now then, whatever we deem necessary down below on earth, or body and mind, wherever what is contained within the greatness of the sky, then the sky itself isn't really affected as far as we know. The sky is just the sky and, and as far as we know, since the beginning of time, human history has, has played itself out beneath the sky. And the skies remained, again, as far as we know, much the same. Countless years of human history have come to pass. People have taken or not taken communion. Religions have risen and fallen. Prophets have come and gone. Spiritual practices have ebbed and flowed. Saints and sinners have played their parts, all beneath the unchanging sky. Well, perhaps that's all I need to say, isn't it? That, that if you if you consider spirit as, as an invisible sky, that, that this visible sky is go beyond that into a sort of transcend the visible to the invisible sky. And we're probably approaching to what I mean by spirit, which is beyond the beyond, and yet it is absolutely here and now this invisible presence is, is what fills this room. It's the very energy that lies behind these words. John, maybe you can talk a little bit 
more about your experience that you touch on in this chapter about li living in Russia in a city as a country nature loving person and then spending time in the church you write about mother of god and it sounds to me like um that was a very powerful experience for you well it rather leads on from the last question and um, i spoke about in our last interview when someone asked me what what is Jesus or how, what do I think about Jesus and I tried to explain that that from uh, first reading about him in the Bible to as I understand him now as the all in all I notice on the on the um, recording the word all somehow the the, um, the subtitles they don't so I'll spell it out, A, A double L, all. I don't think I pronounce it very clearly. The all in all. This is how the last book of the Bible, Revelations, describes Jesus as the all in all. And this I find uh, I find very easy to relate to, at least at this stage of my life. The all in all. Um, well, so in a way, the mother of God also um at least in my experience has expanded and expanded and expanded from from first of all the the, the mother of jesus the, the the holy mother the mother of humanity um to being mother earth itself mother earth the the, the, the then you go up into the cosmos itself the stars to look up uh, you no know, earth below but but where does does an earth merge into the starlight the moon the, where does where does it end and and then and then this wonderful sub never-ending subject of love you see the love that we have the love that men have for women where does it end we always always start off you know thinking of one woman one woman one love one woman, one man, but 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 it expands and expands, doesn't it, into the infinite? Um, I, I I I told you of my the first time I looked into a woman's eyes and expanded to, into the infinite beyond. Well, in a way, this has become almost commonplace for me now. That that, uh, that, that where does woman or, or femininity perhaps end? And, and 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 see as you draw into into spirit itself, masculine and feminine themselves merge into one. You see, because man and woman is duality, and and uh, and there's a beyond where they were. They just it all melts into one. One, one, you see. So, Mother of God or Jesus, you see, we, we in this in this embodiment, we almost have to divide them. But uh, God is one. <laughs> Here we go, here we go, here we go beyond words, because see, words themselves are duality, aren't they? But uh, love always thinks it has to have an object, subject to an object, but it doesn't, my dear. It doesn't. Love is complete in itself. And then love is just in itself, it's just a word, isn't it? Which melts away. Maybe this whole world just melts away. Maybe it never is as real as we think it is. It's real for a season. It has its time, its time and place. 
until it passes. <laughs> so the Holy Mother, but that wonderful, wonderful object of devotion to accompany to accompany us through our mortal pilgrimage. I love her as countless, countless generations have loved her as the embodiment of godliness. And all I can suggest, my dears, is that you let that devotion to her develop as God wills and lead you wheresoever it leads. Follow your hearts. <laughs>